Well, you know, our, our thinking is dominated by all sorts of things, and it's very much dominated by our backgrounds, how we're trained and in what sort of disciplines we're trained, or if we are trained at all. I mean, you can't do science by straight logic. It, it's a philosophical concept, but you can't simply think this is, the way, this is the way it should be because it makes sense, and that's the way it is. I mean, for instance, Galen used that principle to deduce that blood is produced in the heart and flows to the liver where it's destroyed, or something along those lines. You have to do the observation, the experiment, the, the, the measurements, and then you have to make sense of it and write it up and publish it for other people to read and, and, and uh, analyse. Now, that concept is central to all modern science. It's what's allowed our scientific revolution. It's the, the basis of much of what happened in the Renaissance and so forth. But that thinking is not central to someone who is classically educated or who has minimal science education and doesn't really get what it's about. And unfortunately, those people are now in government. The, the, their position on global warming is a purely political decision that's influenced very much by a lot of propaganda that's been put out, but it's convenient for them to think that way, and it makes no sense, and it doesn't fit within the reality, and they, they're simply contemptuous of science. And that's ridiculous. It's a very stupid position to take because you can't deny reality. That Science is not perfect. We don't always get it 100% right. But science that's been going on for 20 plus, 30 plus years and has not modified its basic position is going to be pretty much, pretty much on theme, especially with modern technology and, uh, uh, and, and analytical systems. So they're, they're simply denying uh, reality, quite frankly. And now they will, they will say, well, it's not, uh, it's not the real world you're talking about. When they're talking about the real world, they're talking about the world of short-term economic reality. And that's fair enough. I mean, you, we have to consider that. But it's not the, the underlying reality. The underlying reality is what nature does in, in climate science, not what we think uh, should be appropriate. But I think particularly, say, to a lawyer uh, who has no science training, uh, that that concept is quite alien. I've been trying to write um, to write books that are for a layer audience, but I don't think they get very widely read. People aren't reading books, and of course, politicians don't have time to read books. I'm not saying politicians are badly motivated. It's, it's their life is governed by politics and it's governed by economic realities, especially short-term ones in our political system. So uh, trying to get, to get across to them is very difficult. Uh, we do have a chief scientist, and it depends on the government whether they take any notice of that chief scientist. The British government, for instance, again, a conservative government at the moment, is much more enlightened. Every major department has a chief scientist, and they listen to the chief scientists. And also the Royal Society, which is the British Academy of Science, is quite influential in the UK, and members of it, including former presidents, are often elected to the House of Lords, where they're part of the Review House of Politics. So there's a much greater political voice in, for science in uh, the United Kingdom. If you go to the United States, President Lincoln, at the time of the Civil War, set up the National Academy of Sciences with the specific job of advising government on issues related to science and technology. And it does that, and does it very effectively. Uh, sometimes you have a government that takes good notice, sometimes you don't. We don't have those mechanisms built into our, our society in anything like that way. And so uh, politicians often make uh, complete fools of themselves when they talk about science. We've had good people. Uh, we've, we had a very good uh, science minister or minister responsible for large areas of science in Kim Carr, uh, who took a lot of effort to understand science, though his background was in education and history. But at the moment, I don't think we have a figure like that in the parliament. Do you think uh, a lack of attention towards uh, funding of science and uh, science initiatives in Australia is going to harm Australia in the long term? Uh, yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, but um, because the countries to our north are all pushing ahead with science, Singapore is extremely aggressive. China is extremely aggressive, Taiwan, Korea. There are major developments in all these countries. Korea was a total basket case at the end of the Korean War. They thought it would be like uh, the 
a, a disaster for decades. And of course now it's one of the most dynamic and energetic economies in the world. And it's the quality of the people and the focus uh, on, on effort and on science and technology that's brought Korea forward. And we don't seem to be able to learn that lesson. We, we live off minerals and, and agriculture and have done that. Agriculture's often been very good. Uh, a lot, the best farmers are very early adopters of new technology. Uh, mining, they, they adopt the technology they need, but it's a fairly, fairly limited range of technology. So it's not that we're not sophisticated in some of those senses, and we do have some sophisticated activities here, for instance, to do with uh, carbon fibre technology through CSRO. And CSRO, uh, I think, has done a good job, though it's horribly underfunded to do what it does, and it's just been cut 25%, which seems a particularly stupid thing to do.